Thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. Um, and uh, I must say, I was very impressed about showing how small business can become bigger with Google. And this reminds me that I run a small company on my own. And since yesterday, it's run on Google advertising. So I get um, advertising broadcasted on my new site. And listen, yesterday I earned 7 euro and 42 cent. And this morning it was 11 euro. So there is the question, who gets the cake and who the peanuts? <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, uh, what we're doing there is because we have so many companies, like the companies mm -hmm. I mentioned, who are um, wanting to reach consumers, uh, we're helping you. You've chosen to put advertising from those companies on your website, and we use our technology to understand on an individual page what's the most relevant advertising to serve. And of course, you, you've controlled that. And then we give the majority of any advertising revenue that's generated to mm -hmm. you. We keep a small share to cover the cost of the uh, technology, but actually you get the majority of the revenue. And it is an important point here because advertising is paying for almost all of the free services that we enjoy across the web. And there are problems with advertising. It's sometimes irritating if it follows you around the whole time. But it is what pays for a lot of the services and the information that we enjoy today. So I'm glad it's working for you. I look forward to keeping track of how you're doing on there. And I hope it uh, becomes a more profitable venture for you. OK. Um, many people are afraid that in the new Google or digital world, uh, products are digitalized and disappearing. This is not only a you can make telephone calls with mm -hmm. you. This is a, this is a, a bookstore, mm -hmm. this is a map, this mm -hmm. is a camera, this is a music player, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Uh, so the real world is shrinking, the digital world is growing, and we are going the jobs. So this is uh, the mm -hmm. question people uh, put to us uh, for this mm -hmm. session. Uh, well, two things I make. You, you make a point about physical goods mm -hmm. and services and about jobs, so let's deal with each of them. I think. On the physical goods and services point, in the time of Plato and the Greek philosophers, it was worried that writing was going to lead to the end of conversation. You know, when uh, radio was invented, people were concerned that theatre would be destroyed. When television was invented, people were concerned that radio would be destroyed. And actually, my observation is that this is a world of and. We have more and different ways of communicating, and we can choose to use all of them. So I'm not convinced but that everything's suddenly going to be on my phone and that I won't therefore do anything other than look at my phone, although I have teenage children and you know, I can see that that could be a challenge. Um, but then secondly, that to, to the point on jobs, I made some points in my, in my speech there that uh, actually what we see is uh, the internet economy helping to create jobs at a fast rate. None of us know the net situation that there's going to be and you can see stories and analysis that, that tell you different things about how the change will happen. I do think if you look at the lessons from, from previous industrial revolutions, you see through a fairly short period, a rapid growth in well-being, in prosperity, in GDP, and so on. I think that the internet has the power to do that. When you look in developing markets, you certainly see an acceleration in all those things when people get connected uh, to the web. So I think I'm an optimist, but I wouldn't stand here looking introspectively. I would be looking out, as I say, to the world of five billion and making sure that we're connected to that revolution. Wenn Sie Fragen haben, bitte stellen Sie die einfach. Ich glaube, es gibt auch Mikrofone hier. Wir bringen die Mikrofone zu Ihnen und äh, antworten in allen möglichen Sprachen in Live-Übersetzung. Um, so my next question is, Professor Zimmermann had one point and it is, are those digital markets, are they contestable, are there, is there competition mm. or is there overwhelming uh, a power of a few mm. for I the think, next? I mean, I think, if you look at any moment in time, you might say, well, look, you know, uh, Amazon's there, Google's there, Facebook's there, amazing. But I also mentioned some examples of companies that are growing to nearly a billion users in fewer than three years. And if you talk to the management team at AltaVista, they might have a different view. AltaVista was the world's leading search engine 15 years ago. If you talk to the management at AOL or even at Yahoo, they might disagree. And if you were to join us in the management meeting, you know, we are working extremely hard to stay relevant as the entire internet shifts from the desktop world, which we were used to, to the mobile world, and to think about what products and services we can design. And I think what's interesting in this world is, firstly, I think the barriers to entry are low. As I said, 
It's not a question of who has the most data, it's about how you use that data, and it's about how you really focus on what people are trying to do online. So I think it's a tremendous time of creativity. Uh, I think the, uh, the big names that you know today, it's by no means guaranteed that any of them will uh, be able to hold that position for any more than you know, a, a matter of days or years. So we all have to work hard, and ultimately that's in the interests. I mean, sitting here talking about competition, that's in the interests of innovation and society, I think. Mm -hmm. Any question? So, uh, you, you, have you ever seen? You mentioned uh, the, the change from the desktop to the mobile device. Mm. So what makes the difference? So what makes it so difficult for you, or what changes the view of the consumer mm. uh, uh, when uh, mobile? I think uh, if you think about your own use of the internet um, and what it is today when you have it in your uh, we're losing sound of that. What it, what, how you use the internet today compared with when you only had it on the desktop, it's very different. You have a device that's personal. For many of us, it's never more than one meter away from us. Uh, and we have it to hand all day and all of the time. So we're using it much more uh, for everyday tasks. You know, I arrive in Berlin, I've never looked at where I'm going, but I can look at a map and immediately find my way there, right there in the moment. So I think that's changing a lot. And um, obviously the screen is a different size. We've had to reinvent everything we do in search for the mobile um, because people don't want to type, uh, it's clunky, but you can speak. And so using voice services on mobile changes everything. And more direct answers in particular cases, like I want to get to here, find me the nearest whatever, those things are really helpful as well. So it has changed a, a lot. And I think the other thing about mobile, because uh, the adoption is mo of mobile is going faster than anything we've seen, I think that gives the opportunity for everybody that's connected to innovate and create more. So I think it's probably one of the most dynamic environments ever. If we think the internet revolution was big, the mobile revolution is bigger and faster. Are there new competitors? I mean, absolutely there are new competitors. I mentioned um, Jack Ma, uh, who is the founder of Alibaba, and some of you may have seen he was in Davos, uh, near here, uh, just 10 days ago, and did an amazing uh, speech about what they're doing in China. And if you haven't spent any time I would just encourage you to, to read about what Alibaba are doing. And the Chinese have got scale, they've got ambition, they've got ideas, they've got educated people. And uh, whether it's in mobile handsets, whether it's in internet services, they really are picking up the pace. And I think um, if you were to want to scare people in Europe, you'd say, look, the Chinese are coming. You know, these guys have a huge amount of resources and a huge amount of ambition. Uh, and so I think that's great. But on the other hand, I see lots of people in Berlin in London, in Stockholm, around Europe, who have great internet ideas and are building them for mobile. Everybody's build, building for mobile. Okay. Jede Frage? Christoph Konrad, ich hier vertrete hier in Berlin die Automobile, den Automobile Wirtschaft, den Mittelstand. Und wir fragen und diskutieren natürlich auch, wie geht es weiter bei dem Thema autonom und automatisiertem Fahren. Und die beiden Stichworte sind ja schon gefallen. Beim autonomen Fahren stellen sich eine Reihe äh, Fragen. Ich glaube, kein Rechtsgebiet ist davon nicht betroffen. Der runde Tisch beim Bundesverkehrsminister dokumentiert das. Äh, erst kürzlich hat Herr Setsche äh, deutlich gesagt, er sieht neben rechtlichen Fragen auch ethische Fragen. Stichwort finale Entscheidung bei Unfällen, ähm, äh, Punkte, die nicht ganz unwichtig sind, bis hin zu Datenschutzfragen und, und, und. Das ist schon eine schwierige Geschichte und ähm, ich will das mal zusammenfassen in der Frage, gibt es nicht auch hier den Punkt, wo wir uns fragen müssen, soll man eigentlich alles machen, was man technisch kann oder gibt es nicht auch eine Grenze, auch in diesem Feld? A very smart question about it, the, the border of innovation, the very edge of innovation in the context here of the, the self-driving car. I think what's interesting is um, governments around the world have watched the developments of the self-driving car with great interest. And people may know at Google, we've, we've had uh, self-driving cars on the streets of California driving hundreds of thousands of miles safely. Um, and so it's clear that the technology can be made to work. And one of the most important things was to see, could the technology do that? And I think we know the answer. The technology can now do this. The question is, how can we harness that as society? 
and uh, in Germany and in other countries around the world. Governments are now uh, creating the opportunity for testing and understanding the technology better. Now, personally, I think that's a good way of operating. Let's see what technology can do. Uh, let's understand it. And then let's think about how, as society, we can harness it. So I think there's a danger if you say, well, we could never make this work, that you stop any innovation happening at the beginning. And that means, potentially, we lose out. Now, all of the German car manufacturers are doing their own work on self-driving cars. I think many people have seen what we've done and thought, well, if it's possible, I should invest in this. We might do this in partnership with people. We have partnerships with Bosch and Continental here in Germany to help us with this project at the moment. So I think, who knows exactly how society will use this? I suspect there will be systems in cars that help us all drive more safely, uh, that help us pollute less. Uh, if you've got a teenage uh, child uh, or children as I have, then having them in a car which could take over from time to time would feel like a safer place to go. So I feel that the broader point I would make is let's look at what innovation can do and let's see experimentation and invention and let's learn from that how we as society want to adopt it rather than say immediately we must stop that. Uh, One more question to this, uh, who will be in the driver's seat in this car, the computer industry or the car manufacturer? Well, I think uh, ultimately the majority of the car is going to be the manufacturer. Um, and uh, what we've done, if you think uh, what we've done in mobile devices for a second, we, we built Android, which is an operating system for mobile devices, and we are inspired by Tim Berners-Lee, so we believe in, in an open web and open innovation, producing more invention for everybody. And uh, so you can now see many devices powered by Android. It's the most powerful, it's the most popular operating system uh, in the world. Uh, but many of those devices are using a version of Android that have been customized by other people. And I think that's a great philosophy. So there's versions of Android that Amazon control. There are versions of Android that are used by the Chinese. Uh, and they're nothing to do with Google, but people have taken it because it's an open uh, software system and have built on top of it. And I think that's a great thing to do. So I don't know how the cars example will play out. I would say we're in discussions with all the manufacturers about the technology. Uh, we're in partnership with many of them uh, and we'll see how it moves. And I think uh, hopefully what will happen is more people will focus on this area to make cars that are safer and greener and more sustainable and can use less highway that therefore reduce the need for future road building too. So I'm an optimist about that, but I don't know exactly how this will play out. Dr. Nasko, your Frage, Nixdorf Stiftung. Thank you. Uh, if you compare uh, the impact of digitization in big industry, I would guess that there's not a big difference between American and European companies. Let's take uh, General Electric as compared to Siemens or General Motors as compared to Volkswagen. The impact of digitization, we are talking on Industry 4.0 and so on, is probably quite the same. But also, if we talk about the impact of digitization, we always think about US. Everything comes from US. And then if you analyze that, you found, find out that uh, these are not the big companies. They are the Googles, they are the, the mm -hmm. Facebooks, there is Amazon, there's Uber, and so on, and so on. Now, are those spin-offs of big companies? No. They are individuals who created those companies. Mm -hmm. And now, are there more clever people in the US than in Europe? Maybe not so much. So what's the reason of that difference? Now, we in analyzed that, and, and you mentioned a few of them, uh, the, the distributed market. It's not uniform concerning standards and so on. There were some examples like GSM where we were successful in Europe, but others are not. And uh, then we found out that the financing is sort of different and not the first financing. So if you make a startup, you get some money yeah. in the market. But after that, yeah. if you need big money to make a big company out of that, then we have a problem. Yeah. The, f the private people are not prepared to invest as much. There are much more rich people in the US who are prepared to invest money, take the risk. We don't find them in Europe and not, especially not in Germany. And also, the government is not prepared to really support that, which is only the second best, sol mm -hmm. uh, the second best solution, I would yeah. guess. But anyhow, yeah. it's not available. <clears throat> so would you join that idea that... Uh... Yeah, I mean, I think you make a, a number of extremely good points. Um, 
I think when you spend time in Silicon Valley, it's almost impossible to walk out of a coffee shop without somebody offering you money to, to fund something. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but um, if you're a failed entrepreneur, people want to give you money, and that's not always the attitude in, in, uh, in Europe. Um, I think that access to finance is part of the issue, but I don't think it's the whole issue. And one of the reasons we brought Google Ventures is because it, we, we sort of focus on that, that gap between the angel investor and the large-scale finance, which was really poorly served in Europe. But actually, there is a growing uh, set of uh, organizations that want to fund startups here and that see startups uh, here. The other point you make, I think, which is also interesting is, is the traditional large corporation capable of innovating at the speed uh, of the digital economy? And I think that's a very tough challenge because, I mean, I sit on the board of a big retailer in the UK, Sainsbury's. It's a great company, hundreds of thousands of employees. It's successful because it does a million things right every day. And a structure that allows you to do that isn't always the same structure that allows you to innovate. So I think what we'll see is an expansion of, the, of different forms of companies, much more partnerships. Uh, you know, our relationship as Google with many large companies is very multifaceted. You know, we might be supplying Android handsets to them. We might be helping them monetize their website. We might have a partnership around data and security and privacy. We're, you know, there, there are, so we're competing, we're suppliers, we're partners, we're competitors, each is supplying the other. I think those kind of more complicated relationships will be the new norm. But personally in Europe, I think we need a single rule book. We need ambition. We have to encourage people who start a business to think immediately of 500 million consumers, if not 5 billion. And I think that ambition, I'm starting to see more and more in Europe, but it's certainly the default in the US. Thank you. Professor Blum, Sie haben gesehen, mächtig ist der, der das Mikrofon hat. Und das ist jetzt hier. <lacht> Tut mir leid. Ja, guten Tag, mein Name ist Barbara Elisabeth Schäfer. Ich bin äh, Ehrenpräsidentin eines Wirtschaftsverbandes für Frauen. Und ich habe hier drei Fragen. Und zwar, äh, ob in den Apps keine Backdoors sind, wo irgendwas eingeschleust werden kann, was die Nutzer nicht wollen, das ist die erste Frage. Die zweite, das, was die Nutzer und Nutzerinnen stört, ist einfach, dass die Verträge einseitig sind, was wir jetzt seit einer Woche ungefähr wissen, dass wir nicht ändern können, selber ändern können oder ablehnen können, wenn Google irgendwas verändert, was wir nicht wollen. Das ist sehr ärgerlich. Und nehmen Sie bitte die Senioren mit, viele Senioren, nicht die, die hier sitzen, lehnen, <lacht> möchte ich mal betonen, aber viele eben der Senioren lehnen also das, die Smartphones, die aktuellen Smartphones ab. Sie behaupten, sie wollen lieber Neandertaler sein, sie wollen keine neuen Smartphones, sie wollen diese ganze neue Internetgeschichte nicht. Und die müssen Sie unbedingt mitnehmen, die müssen Sie ansprechen. Ich bedanke mich. Hm. Hm. Yes, um, so you raised three really good questions. I think uh, apps um, and in general when people are visiting the internet using apps or visiting websites, we work really hard to try to protect you against uh, malware, uh, so programs that will come and attack your systems or do uh, things you don't want them to do on your devices. It's a constant battle. Um, we actually reported yesterday, I, th I think, on the number of uh, advertising uh, uh, propositions that we disabled last uh, year, it was in the uh, hundreds of millions. Uh, because we're, we're spotting things where they're trying to install malware. So uh, I think it's never going to be perfect that, that it, you know, companies like ours can completely protect you, but I think we work extremely hard to try to protect you against those things. And of course, you won't use our services or other people's services if you find that they are subject to those issues. But it's a challenge for the internet, and as I say, we work really hard on it. I mean, I, th I think the second thing on the internet you mentioned, and the, the broader point is contracts. So how many people you know, always read a contract before they sign it. Well, all of us do. Well, you're online, how many people ever read the terms and conditions before they click the accept button? Hardly anybody. And I think this is one of the, one of the challenges that, you know, we have to try to set high standards together of what we expect uh, to happen online. And this is a new area, but clearly very, very long terms and conditions are not uh, sufficient to educate consumers. So what we try to do is, alongside having the necessary legal conditions, we try to make it possible for you to understand our policies through short videos that sort of explain in much more human terms what's going on. And then if you want to read the longer legal, you can. But I, I agree, it's a, it's a challenge and we're all getting used to these new uh, products and services. And the third point you make, I think is a really important point, which is the risk of there being a class of people, whether it is age or whether it is income or whether it is geography, a class of people who are excluded from 
connecting to the internet. If we all believe that having access to the internet is good for jobs and growth and prosperity and education and culture, which I think you know, overwhelmingly the evidence is that it's, it's, it's got many of those benefits, then how do we help people get access to those services? The way we try to do it is we try to make every product we build as simple as possible. As simple as possible. You don't need to know how to control anything. You don't even need to know how to spell to use Google. You know, if you start typing something, we'll correct it. You can just speak to us. OK, Google and will uh, be there. So we try to make our products as simple as possible. But I also think govern governments have a role to play here. Most of the research I've seen suggests that governments connecting with the citizen digitally save money and improve the quality of services the citizens get. So there is a job for governments to make sure that we connect everybody as well. Professor Bloom. Yeah, thank you very much, first, for your very Anglo-Saxon optimism and belief <laughs> in the spirit of competition. I think that's something which uh, continental Europe lacks, and it's good uh, uh, to s spread the message. Thank you. But beyond that, I thought you had made a brilliant uh, analog with sport. But let's come to this analog. Um, usually, uh, you, everybody can, act, can purchase this platform, this ship. Mm -hmm. um, it's different in two-sided markets. Sometimes you, the, the first mover will own the platform and no other boats will go along. This might be the end of competition. Then you have a, in this real world of physical goods, it's easy to have a good intelligence and reconnaissance division to look around how well do the rowers perform, how well are the, build, are the ships built. In the digital economy, it's much more difficult to, sh to look at that. So my first question is, how is your strategic intelligence and reconnaissance division built up to look around where the new ideas and the new threats to your position come? Perhaps you could say something unless you are forbidden to do so. There might be a solution to that, and that's something we start to see more and more often because of the incredible success of these platforms like Google you earn a lot of money and you don't then have to pick the winners as the, uh, 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 as the uh, uh, government or somebody who wants to spend venture capital does, you just buy the winners. And if you look at the purchases in the, uh, uh, in the, in the digital business, you see that there is a huge concentration simply by buying up innovative ideas that could become competitors to your existing ideas. And that, in the long run, may mean in the Schumpeterian system that the, entre the digital entrepreneur dies from its own success. Okay, thank you. Well, I, I'm not sure whether my sporting analogy will extend to two-sided markets or Schumpeterian destruction, um, although I can't remember many times where I beat the Germans in sport, so I think you should be more optimistic. And, and I haven't even mentioned football. Um, uh, but I think, um, so when I look at Google, you know, is it analogous to say, well, you know, if there's a great, a better boat, then somebody will use, choose to use that boat. Will that apply to Google? And I think, you know, what we do is for the user, the competing services are a click away. And, and the history of search has certainly been the case that different players have been prominent at different times. And uh, actually scale is not um, a key factor in success in search. So I think one of the things that's interesting here is, you know, we're, we're um, popular because the service works well. The service doesn't work well because we're popular. So it's not like the telephone. The more people are on the telephone service, the more useful it is to have a telephone. With Google Search, you know, if you're using one search engine and he's using another and I'm using a third, if they work for all of us, that's great. It doesn't matter how many people are using it as long as there's you know, enough data to be able to improve the results. So I think uh, that's true. The other side of our business is advertising. And we make it easy, just as I talked about, for the user to take out their data. We make it any, easy for anybody to use our advertising services to also build for competing platforms as well. So again, in that way, I hope we're trying to make it easy for competition and innovation to, uh, to happen. Then you make a point about, will the big tech companies just be able to buy any startup that looks interesting? And I guess that's, that's always been a historic uh, challenge in markets, you know, does somebody sort of buy a wall of businesses? I worked in the newspaper industry for a while, and that's an interesting example. You know, competing newspapers to a city would often be either bought up 
or very low price competitors would be launched against those newspapers and in that way the newspaper industry controlled you know, markets quite strongly until actually the internet came along and offered people uh, more choice again. So I think um, here what I see is actually the most ambitious startups want to stay as startups and you know, our founders see this as well. You know, it gets more challenging the more you're involved in uh, to be successful and innovative. And if I take an example here, so WhatsApp, some people will know WhatsApp, you may use it, your children may use it more often. Uh, WhatsApp was 50 engineers and it sold for $19 billion to Facebook. Uh, it's an amazing uh, story. And we looked at that at Google and actually, you know, at Google we didn't have a great messenger app. Uh, we had stuff which we were trying to do that integrated across lots of product areas. So how come a company with Google's might didn't invent WhatsApp? Well, the answer is because we're larger and we're trying to join things up and actually what they did was something that was very specialized and fast. I mentioned Snapchat. Snapchat have been approached with billion plus, several billion offers from various people and they've declined uh, to be bought because they believe in the model. These guys are in their early 20s. What do they know? They know more than everybody else and so they're staying they're staying independent. So I'm not sure that we'll see that model. I think that people worry about being part of a larger, more bureaucratic company to the point about you know, the Siemenses uh, and the General Electrics. So I think, we'll see, I think we'll see a range of different models here from portfolios of companies that are not particularly tightly related to larger companies that are trying to be as innovative and fast as they can, but it's hard to be fast and uh, large. Eine Frage aus dem Hintergrund des Raumes, die ich nicht, ah ja. Um, uh, I'm come from China. I can perfect English, but uh, um, uh, for pro te uh, for testing the translation system, I will speak German. <laughs> ich vertrete hier eigentlich China, weil ich Chineser bin. Ich vertrete auch die Ever Stiftung, weil ich frisch gebackener internationaler wissenschaftlicher Beirat bin. Aber eigentlich vertrete ich nur meine Frau, weil sie nicht hier, nicht in Berlin ist. Meine Frage ist, Sie haben gerade sehr viel von China erzählt und jeder weiß, dass China der größte Markt der Welt in den nächsten 20, 30 Jahren wird. Alibaba kann ein Geschäft mit der chinesischen Regierung vereinbaren. Ja? Und Google ist jetzt von der chinesischen Regierung abgeschnitten vom chinesischen Markt. Meine Frage ist, also Sie sind natürlich nur für Deutschland zuständig, aber würde Google später den Markt der China verzichten können? Das ist ein, die eine Seite der Frage. Die andere Frage ist, die chinesische Regierung, die chinesische Regierung schränkt jetzt ganz stark die digitale Freiheit, Pressefreiheit in China ein. Und äh, würde Google zum Beispiel später mit solch einer Regierung zusammenarbeiten wollen? Andererseits, äh, ich äh, benutze selber auch äh, früher Google und Gmail. Äh, wie könnte ich mir äh, bewusst sein, dass alle meine Daten, die durch meine digitale Kommunikation per Google äh, praktisch ihre Firma angeliefert habe, später nicht der US-Regierung angeliefert wird. Dankeschön. Darf ich, darf ich wegen der fortgeschrittenen Zeit noch die letzte Frage gleich dazu nehmen? Oder Herr Grüner, dann kriegen Sie die letzte Frage. Zunächst Sie bitte. Vielen Dank, mein Name ist Ralf Zeppernick. Wie mein Vorredner möchte ich auch in Deutsch sprechen weil ich es auch sehr wichtig finde, dass wir weiterhin hochqualifizierte Dolmetscher haben. Denn selbst ein Deutscher, der sehr gut Englisch spricht, ist immer in einer Verhandlung im Nachteil gegenüber einem Native Speaker. Dies gesagt, mein Kompliment an Sie, Mr. Britten, für einen brillanten Vortrag. Ich glaube, Sie haben die Interessen von Google exzellent dargestellt. <lacht> das Kompliment war ernst gemeint. Nun zu meiner Frage. Stichwort Wettbewerb, fairer Wettbewerb und hier möchte ich hinweisen auf fairen Wettbewerb bei Steuern. Viele der heute genannten Namen, ich erwähne nur noch Amazon, sind dadurch berühmt geworden in letzter Zeit, dass sie wesentlich weniger an Steuern zahlen als deutsche Unternehmen zum Beispiel oder europäische Unternehmen. 
Deswegen meine Frage, wie hoch ist der Prozentsatz, den Google an Steuern zahlt in Deutschland und in Europa, bezogen auf die Gewinne, die Sie hier machen? Sollten diese ebenfalls wesentlich niedriger liegen, welche Überlegungen gibt es bei Google, hier in einen fairen Wettbewerb einzutreten? Vielen Dank. Sir, you have difficult question. Are you afraid of Alibaba? Uh, do you pay taxes and do you not sell the data to the United States government? So, uh, this is a very intelligent audience, may I say. Some very good questions coming from all of you, so thank you. And uh, again, apologies, apologies for my lack of uh, German language skills. Um, uh, so, taxes. Um, absolutely, there's a lot of discussion, particularly about uh, successful US tech companies in this field. And um, as a European, I really see, you know, if you're sitting in Germany or if you're sitting in the UK and you see companies with very high revenues coming out of uh, particular markets and you pay tax on your income, you look at a company and say, well, this company should be contributing more in my country. And I mean, it's, it's a great shame to me that, that Google isn't a German company. If we were a German company, we'd pay, we'd earn our profits in Germany and we'd pay tax proportionate to the profits in Germany. As it is, we're an American company, and therefore we're required by the international tax laws to uh, earn our profits uh, principally in the US. And that's the reason why we pay relatively low, we, we earn relatively low profits here. Of course, we pay taxes at the prevailing rate on corporations' profits in every country uh, that we operate in. And our headquarters in Europe is actually in Dublin. So I mentioned we have 1,100 people in Germany. We have nearly 5,000 people in Dublin, and they serve customers and consumers in every country in Europe. So the taxes we pay here, I'd love it if we paid more as a European. If we were started in Europe, we would have to pay more. We follow the international rules. It would be great if the international rules were less complicated because they'd be more understandable to the person in the street and corporations could focus on you know, doing what they should be doing, which is providing jobs, growth, employment, and a contribution to society in all kinds of ways, including the tax system. Um, well, below the line, the percentage. <laughs> I, I mean, I, so the percentage is whatever the percentage tax rate is in Germany or the UK or whichever country we operate in. So we pay the, the prevailing tax rate in every country. The challenge is how big is the profit in every country, which is it has to be big in the US. Um, and that's actually a, a, a by design of the single European market in, in, the, in Europe. Um, the second question, uh, China, uh, and thank you to the gentleman who puts us to, cha to shame by being trilingual uh, here. Um, China is an amazing country, and uh, Google does have operations in China. Uh, we just no longer have a censored search service in China. And um, it's a real shame to us that we weren't able to continue to provide that. But we felt that the original intent, which was even with a censored service, when you search for results, we're saying your government doesn't want to see this result, that we felt, felt that was contributing to openness and contributing positively to people in China, but at some point we realized that that strategy was not being successful, just looking at how people are using our services and some of the attacks that we were having on our services as well. So now we have an operation in China which helps Chinese companies reach the rest of the world, and we have a simplified Chinese search service that's sent from uh, Hong Kong. Um, I think it's hard to ignore China for everybody and anybody, and therefore the more engaged in China you are, the more you can understand the world of tomorrow, uh, but certainly uh, there are some principles, uh, particularly around freedom of speech and protection of our users' data that we hold very hard, and therefore we've made a call which is you know, not brilliant for the near-term business opportunity, but we think is the right call for our values and for the values of our users. And that relates to your second point around the protection of your data. Um, and the Snowden revelations, I think, um, you know, here in Germany and in, in uh, London, where I live, and across Europe, were met with uh, astonishment by many of us. And uh, since those revelations, we move very fast to encrypt all of our services and all of the cables between data centers and so on to try to really ensure that we're protected. There's no back door. Um, we we uh, have official processes where governments will come to us and say, we need to access the data of this person's Gmail account. And if there's a court process that's been gone through that uh, shows that the, you know, the, the government is requiring that access as part of the criminal process, of course, we'll comply with that. But we absolutely will not give wholesale access to governments. Uh, who, who want to be able to access that data in that way. I think that's an important uh, matter of trust for users in the services that we and other people provide. And we think that 
governments with appropriate oversight should be able to manage uh, in this new area just as they've managed in other areas of data and uh, information security. But I know we feel it particularly acutely uh, here in Europe uh, when we saw those revelations. Um, I think those were the three questions. Okay, L last question, Mr. Gruner. Uh, my name is Martin Gruner. Uh, we have heute here nachdrücklich gehört, dass Bildung die Voraussetzung für eine Bewältigung der digitalen Revolution tatsächlich sei. Meine Frage ist, welche Art von Bildung eigentlich gefordert ist? Und die Frage auch an Google, welche Art von Bildung halten Sie für wichtig? Denn die, Vora die formalen Voraussetzungen, etwa ein Abitur oder ein Hochschulabschluss, be bewirkt ja nicht, dass etwa die riesige Arbeitslosigkeit unter jungen Menschen behoben wird in Europa. Jeden Tag lesen wir in der Zeitung, welches Riesenproblem da besteht. Und die Frage ist natürlich, können wir für diese jungen Leute etwas tun? Und wie muss die Bildung sein, die dann tatsächlich dazu führt, dass die jungen Leute in der digitalen Welt eine Chance haben? I think that, I mean, a great question to end on, given, given where we stand in Europe today with youth unemployment. I mean, I spent some time in Spain recently and in Greece. I mean, you, these are serious social problems for Europe. And yet there is a mismatch. You know, there are vacant jobs and there are people without jobs. And I think there are sort of two levels of answers, I would say, on education. In, in the near term, as I mentioned when I spoke, you know, a, a, a significant proportion of German businesses are reporting that lack of digital skills are a barrier to uh, their growth. And so there are digital skills that can help. And one of the things I think about digital skills is they require a combination of the arts and the sciences. And I think, you know, certainly uh, in the British education system, and I think also in the German education system, we tend to split arts and science quite early in the system. And I think that's a problem in today's world because you need to be able to understand data and patterns of data, but you also need to be creative and you need to be able to um, uh, think about communications and innovate in different ways. So I think even in digital skills in the near term, we need people who can understand data and analytics, but who can also create new ideas and test and learn. And there's a broader point I would make, which is you know, my children are teenagers and they are going through a conventional education system, which is pretty recognizable actually to uh, me and to my father and to my grandfather and probably to his grandfather. And um, there's a great uh, educationalist who's um, popular around the world now called Ken Robinson. And he says that, you know, we're all training our children to be factory managers 150 years ago. And what we need to train them to do is to be creative. And I have some sympathy with that. I think that when I'm hiring people at Google, I'm looking for people who are problem solvers, who can be creative, who are curious, who will jump in and try things. And in this digital world, trying things understanding what happens and improving them is really the way that we have to operate. And uh, it's quite different from a world of developing long-term detailed analysis that then allows you to build a business case that then allows you to, you need those skills still because we still need capital plant, but we also need much more of that curious, creative uh, mindset. And I worry that our education system is not always uh, producing people with those, uh, those skills and that our society doesn't always celebrate. I know my kids uh, told every time that they don't bring the right textbooks to the class, but they're not always told you did a great job every time they kind of do something that's creative. So I think near term digital skills in the medium term, we need to think about a more creative, a more curious uh, workforce. And uh, I think that's also good for society. Thank you, Matt, for this discussion, which is very open. And uh, in the meantime, my Google revenue went up to 15 euro 20 cents. So it's improving. This has uh, nothing to do with me, I'd like to say. <laughs> We'll take, we'll take your uh, question of um, uh, the single digital market and the one set of rules into the afternoon with Mr. Oettinger and thank you for coming and... Well, thank you so much for having me and, and thank you for bearing with my English. Thank you.